<laughs> Is the mic still working? Yeah, yeah we're good. <laughs> I feel like there's a, a bit of a conspiracy going on. We've got the Aussies going first with old mate Brian and then me going last. So the Americans are putting a little bit of pressure on here. <laughs> so uh, I love the feeling of like coming out where it's like boom, 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 boom. Like, just before, it's like, I got this, it's all good. And then the heart starts going and you feel the blood pumping through your veins and it's like it kind of makes you realize that you are actually alive. And that's what I love about chasing success. That's what I love about going out there in the world and taking risks. And so I credit a lot of my success uh, to that very thing, to taking a chance at building the courage and having faith that me putting my own self and sharing my own unique gifts to the world is actually going to do something for the world itself. Um, today, I don't have a structure on my speech. I'm pulling this out of like nowhere, really. And um, I just want to put trust in it because every other speech I do, it's usually structured. Um, so today I'm just really here having a conversational piece with you guys. Um, so with Addicted to Success, obviously, you know, build a big website in movies, front cover of magazines and so on. And that's great. But what I love most about all of that is actually the story itself before all those things. So that's just like the highlight, but the story, that's really where we learn our lessons. And so a lot of people, they see the glory, but they don't actually see the story. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to share my story and how it all developed to get me to this level today. Because I do a lot of interviews and people always ask me the techniques and the hacks and everything else. But to be honest, it's not really what's going to get you there. It's going to be the hard yards before that and the lessons are really in there. So who here is into self-development? That's a no-brainer, right? <laughs> When, do, you, do you remember the first time you ever fell in love with self-development? When you first picked up that book or you watched a movie that inspired you or saw a speaker that just jazzed you up? Now, maybe just a few people around the room, put your hands up if you remember how old you actually were and just share at the back of the room. 15? Wow, amazing. Jeff? Eight. Eight years old. Javon? 13? Hey. Go ahead, buddy. 15. All right. Oh Nicole? <laughs> Seven. I love it. I love it. Hey, Ruby? 26. 26. <laughs> and Preston? I'm 27. Wow. All right. That's cool. So I, I don't want to miss out on you. It's, it's kind of scary for all You were four years wow. old. What, what was it? What did you pick up on at four years old? Well, I, was sitting, I was sitting on the porch with my grandmother's mother's school teacher. Uh -huh. And she started by telling me that there was nothing that uh, I couldn't do, that nothing could stop me. Wow. And she was talking about how I came from a people uh -huh. who learned how to make a way out on their own. Wow. Powerful, powerful. Can you repeat that? I she said, that. yeah, go ahead. If you could say it louder, because that's really profound. Please share. I Wow, that melts my heart. I absolutely love that because this just shows you that it doesn't always have to be a book. It doesn't have to be a movie. Like you learned it from one person and it ingrained in you and you carry that belief. And so when I look at my story and how everything developed, if I could pinpoint a time where I, was, where I felt, first fell in love with self-development, it would have been around when I was like seven years old and I watched this movie and it was like, it's one of the greatest movies of all time. It's called Space Jam with Michael Jordan and Bugs Bunny. Who doesn't love Space Jam, right? So I was this little jazzed up kid, like asked my mom to get me a plastic six foot ring and I was out there like jumping on bricks and dunking, because I was pretty short, right? Junk, dunking the uh, ring, uh, jumping off uh, bricks and I was getting just so excited about the whole idea of playing in the NBA and 
I told my mom, you know, I want to be like Michael Jordan. And she's like, you can't be like Michael Jordan. You know, you be Joel. And I'm like, oh, I want to be the white version of Mike. You know, be like Mike. And she's like, no, 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 no. So she was really trying to put a lot of self-development, uh, trying to instill a lot of self-development in me at a young age. And I'm so blessed. Like, I love my mom to pieces. Uh, she gave me Michael Jordan's Rare Air autobiography book at seven years old. And that's where I was first exposed to the idea of uh, training your mind. And he talked a lot about mindset and about your daily rituals and your habits and surrounding yourself with people that are better than you to increase your levels, right? So that's when I started to really build belief. I was like, oh, I really want to be in the NBA. And I, really, I just went all in. I started to become obsessed, obsessed, addicted to success. And my mom at the time was uh, seeing that I was like really getting into all these things. And I was asking lots of questions. So she gave me a book called uh, 50 Ways to Make Pocket Money. And so it's so, uh, like seven years old. Um, I went through probably about 20 of the different ways out of 50, like making dog biscuits and <laughs> like lemonade stands and garage sales. And one of them that I really hit on, which was pretty awesome, was uh, I would work with the next door neighbor for 50 bucks over like the stretch of like a week in the holidays. And then I'd get that $50. I'd go down to the store and I'd buy $50 worth of Toblerone bars and mint patties and I'd go around and knock on all the neighbors' doors and sell it back to them at double the price. Because I learned about profits. Like, this is crazy. You can sell like double the price. They don't even know. They knew. I think they felt sorry for me. So they're like, all right, cool. We'll buy a few bars. So anyway, I had like 100 bucks. I went out and bought all these like um, Fleur NBA basketball cards, like all the limited edition ones. I was like trading them at school. I was selling them off. I was just making more and more money. And that's where I really started to embrace the idea of like having no limits. Like, you could just do anything you want. So I like... I didn't really feel like I had a lot of limiting beliefs at a young age, I was supported. I think it's really important, like interviewing hundreds of successful people nowadays, I find that this is like one of the key things is to really uh, have a lot of empowering beliefs in play. And so I had that at a young age, I was so blessed to have that. Um, and what I did was, you know, I, I, I was playing basketball, I was getting close to getting into state. Uh, instead of uh, playing basketball and chasing the basketball around the basketball court, I entered high school and I started chasing girls. And so I got distracted, and uh, what was interesting was my mom uh, used to drop me off at school every day in year eight. I just, just got in there. I was still 12 years old. And she used to say to me when I'd jump out of the car, she used to say, take a risk. Try something different. I was like, wow, that's cool, you know? Okay. So anyway, that year, I uh, ended up punching somebody out because they were messing with my mates and me. Um, I let off a flamethrower in the middle of science class and got detention. And I went across the road and stole chocolates from the grocery store and got arrested. So <laughs> my mom had to pull me aside and give me the whole lecture of like, that's not really taking the risk that I was telling you about. You, know, you really need to step it up a bit here. Uh, so she gave me rich dad, poor dad, I was like 12 years old. And um, that's you know, Robert Kiyosaki's book. I don't know if you've heard of it before. If you haven't, you're probably living under a rock. But uh, that book is absolutely amazing. A lot of it went over my head at 12 years old. I didn't quite understand all the concepts. There's two things that really stood out. One thing was um, that having a job, a nine to five, is actually very unstable. You could lose your job, the economy can crash, there's a lot of problems there. You, you have limits, right, to how much you can make. So I remembered that. And I also remembered that uh, you don't have to work for money, you can make money work for you. And so that really sat with me for a long time. And what I did was um, I had a lot of like, African friends, Somali and Jamaican friends. I was like really into like hip hop and music and everything. I started developing a passion for music. I was like the whitest, ghettoest guy down under. You know, I had like do rags and big, yeah, it's kind of embarrassing, don't laugh. <laughs> and uh, anyway, so I went all in on that. Once again, obsessed, right? Just really obsessed with the idea of like building this up. Even though it was like an identity issue, probably. Um, I really went all in, and what I did was I went and I actually uh, started knocking on the doors of these uh, radio stations to get on a radio show, and they didn't let me. I went there week after week. They, finally, they said, look, you can intern here for free. It was like volunteer. So I was like, all right, cool, I'll take that. Um, and what I did was I started reaching out to record labels in America and then telling them, hey, I can get your music played on one of Australia's biggest hip-hop and R&B radio stations. And so I couldn't really, but you know, anyway, I got, I got the records and I was getting all these exclusive records from all these record labels and I was bringing them to the DJs. I'm like, where the hell are you getting these? And you never expose your secrets, right? It's like, I just got connections, you know? 
And anyway, so, uh, so after a while, the uh, manager of the station found out that I was bringing in all this exclusive stuff and they decided to give me my own little run on a radio show at midnight and it absolutely took off. People were leaving the other time slots and going and tuning into my show. And then I started interviewing a lot of uh, big artists, right? And with that, I leveraged off that and I started reaching out to these artists and then started shopping uh, beats and tracks from some of my friends that produce music and I ended up uh, scoring a, a record deal with Atlantic Records in the US. This is like 20 years old, right? So I flew out to the US, living in Miami, living a glamorous life, working in the studio with all these big major label artists and you know, seeing what happens behind the scenes. And I was like 20 years old in a room with like 40 year olds uh, that are running uh, you know, these record labels. And within about two years, I found myself every day waking up just feeling like empty. I just felt like there was, I had no control over the situation. I kept getting that feeling and remembering that line from Robert Kiyosaki's book about you don't have to work for money, you can make money work for you. And I felt out of control and I wanted to be in control, right? It's kind of a, an entrepreneurial thing. You want to be in control of your business and manage your own money and have everything running, right? So for me, I was like, I was getting the itch and I was like, I need to get out of here. And all my friends, my family, everybody thought I was crazy. I was like ditching this incredible life, traveling around the world uh, with all these amazing people. And I was... I decided to fly back to Perth in Western Australia. And so I remember sitting on the tarmac in Chicago and the plane wouldn't take off because there was like no, uh, the windscreen wiper wasn't working and it was raining so it was too dangerous. So I ended up missing my connecting flight from San Francisco to Sydney and I had to stay in this motel in, uh, Sydney, in uh, San Francisco. And I remember laying there at like two o'clock in the morning just like, just really questioning myself, like did I make a, the right decision? You know, is this right? What am I going to do? And I remember Tony Robbins' infomercial was playing like 2 o'clock in the morning, right? And he gives a lot of value in his infomercial. He's not just selling, selling, selling. I was just laying there. I'm like, this, this like goofy, like seven foot eight dude or however tall he is, he's massive. It's like, he's kind of cool. He's kind of interesting. And so I went back to Perth and I started Googling Tony Robbins or Yahoo. I think it was like Yahoo at the time, whatever was going on then. And uh, yeah, and I started reading some of his books. And it was interesting, I, I like read some of it and I put it down, I was like, okay, I don't know if I'm ready for that yet, but it's cool. And then I, I got a sales job. In that sales job, uh, I actually started getting promotions. So I like worked my way up the ladder and I was good at it because I wanted to make money. I was like very driven by money. And the CEO of the company brought in Jordan Belfort, who's the Wolf of Wall Street. I don't know if you've seen that movie with Leonardo DiCaprio. Uh, but it's based off him and he's kind of crazy. He's made like $150 million back in the day, ripping people off, doing unethical things, but he's like changed his life around. Now he's teaching people how to do sales in an ethical way. And so he was kind of like my mentor and I saw like greatness in him and for like some of the wrong reasons and for some right reasons too. And I remember him challenging me in this workshop and he was like, what is your vision for success? Uh, what are your goals and you know, what are your strengths? What are your passions? What, what, are you, what solution are you bringing to the world? It's kind of the first time in my life where I actually had somebody challenge me to actually write it down in front of them and read it out in front of everybody. And so it put me in a place where I started to create all this clarity around where I wanted to go in life. And I never wanted to put myself in this situation, but it kept coming up. And what I found was like over the years, these things kept popping up, like the books and the, the Tony Robbins on the TV and the, you know, Jordan Belfort. It's like kind of like life was steering, or God or, you know, the universe was like steering me into that direction. And I was trying to kind of fight it because I thought I knew best, right? So anyway, I uh, started Addicted to Success. And uh, at the time, I was making no money because with blogs, what you need to do is you need to create a community around your website first. I couldn't put ads on my site because if I did, it would drive everybody away. So... I found in that workshop with Jordan Belfort that, you know, I love self-development, um, I'm good at computers, and a solution for the world would be, well, I could share these inspirational things with, you know, everybody else. So I was reading T. Harv Eker books and uh, uh, Tony Robbins books, Brian Tracy and so on. And so I, I started creating articles on Addicted to Success. And the thing is, I was a really, I thought I was a really terrible writer because in high school, I got D's and F's in English because I didn't stick to what I had to, the criteria for the essays. I just kind of created all my own unique stuff and I used to get bad marks. Uh, so I had this belief, limiting belief, that I'm no good at English. And what happened was, as I developed the website, it got to a point where I had to write some content. And I wrote my first article 
And I remember it just, it went viral. It just took off. It was like amazing. I couldn't believe it. I was like, wow. Wrote another one and it did, all the articles I was writing outperformed all the other articles that I had like repurposed or put videos up. And then I started to build my belief that, wow, maybe I'm not really that bad at English. And what it is, is people want things simplified, right? I couldn't write it like a medical research paper like a lot of other people. And that in itself is too complex to understand. So I did very straightforward articles and it worked. And so it took off and I started implementing share bars on my website and people love to feel inspired. There's a formula there and they started sharing my content all around the world. And I remember picking up, picking up. My mo money was still my motivation. Um, I ended up taking a job to work. This is crazy, like Australians would think even this is like super cliche. I worked up north in the desert. It's like 132 degrees Fahrenheit every day, uh, catching snakes and lizards and kangaroos. I was in the fauna handling team with an environmental, at the environmental team with Chevron, and I was clearing the land for them. So I had to go and catch snakes, and anyway, that's another story. Uh, but I did it for the money, and there's a lot of negative people around me because we're working 28 days straight with a week, uh, with just a week off, and I come back and work another 28 days straight. And so I remember jumping in the car, and to unplug from all the negativity, I'd play like Tony Robbins tapes, and he he went all in on like, you've got if your back's against the wall, you've got to burn the fucking boats. Right, he's like, you gotta, like, there's no other option. You've gotta get in and make it happen. And I was just so inspired by that. Uh, so I went in and I just started doubling up on all the content I was creating. I started like reaching out and networking with people to grow addicted to success. Um, and in that, literally in the space of like three months, it jumped from like 400,000 views to over a million views. I was making about $6,000 a month uh, just from advertising alone, residual income, right? And I started writing eBooks and I was selling eBooks and I started to create uh, multiple streams of income. And I remember the day I walked in and I told my pain in the ass boss, it's costing me too much to be here and I fired my boss. And that feeling, just that feeling like, it's funny because money was my motivation, but I remember hopping in the car and booking a trip to Italy. I never left, I never gone to Europe and I just remember like driving back that day and I was like, oh my God, this is actually what I was looking for. I was looking for freedom, not money itself. And so this is the thing, right? Like a lot of people are in a, what I call the paper prison, right? They're so trapped in the idea of like why they need money. And the way to get out of it is to understand what are you, how do you value money, right? Some people value money in a way where they want it for significance. Some people want it because they want power. Some people want it because they want security. Some people want it because they want freedom. Not knowing that they can get some of these things without actually having physical money itself. They can find it in other ways. And so I learned that early on and I started teaching a lot of people that, uh, which is, you know, it's, it's helped so many people. And another thing as well that I learned in that process, which I hope is a lesson that you can instill in you, is stop chasing fucking unicorns, right? AKA somebody, else, somebody else's definition of success. And I was so like highly influenced by all these successful people thinking, because I didn't develop my own story. I didn't truly know myself. I wasn't self-aware at that point in time. I had a lot of work to do still. And I was looking at other people and like Preston said, putting them up on a pedestal. Right? And that's the wrong thing to do. Like, yeah, they're great, but where is that greatness that lies in them? Where does that lie within you? Go for that. And so it, it was an interesting process. You know, I, uh, I reached within about another year, so we're about, three, we're about three years in. I reached around about 40 million views worldwide and over like two million something followers on social media. And I had the opportunity then to use that as leverage to reach out to some bigger and better people in the industry. And I had the opportunity to actually interview Tony Robbins, which is crazy because he's, you know, I looked at him as somebody that had so much greatness in him and I, I wanted to replicate the things he was doing, but in my own way. And it was so great to have a conversation with him. And one thing really stood out to me in, in the conversation with Tony. And I said to Tony, um, and this is going to relate to a lot of you that are playing in this space right now. I said, Tony, you know, right now there's, there's like a cesspool of all these people that call themselves coaches and bloggers and, uh, you know, YouTubers and so on. Like, how do the real people stand apart? And he said, it's quite simple. He said, you know, the, the cream rises to the top. So a lot of people are not willing to master, they dabble. He said, even if you commit, he said, even if you just like slowly worked away at it, but you said, I'm going to do this 10 years minimum, you're going to be well known in your industry. You're going to be the one that hung in there and you, you're, you're going to be the one that's going to be remembered, right? I was like, wow. And like when I thought about my website and speaking and coaching and everything I'm doing, 
I didn't even think about a 10 year minimum. I'm like, this is, I'm in this for life. I'm trying to wife this bitch, you know? <laughs> I was like, that's it. I'm, I'm in it, you know? And so uh, it was interesting. He says that and I, and I asked him, you know, so how can we really stand apart? What can we action? And he said, he said, um, the biggest advantage you can have in business and even in life is truth. And the only way you can gain truth is through experience. You have to get your hands dirty. You've got to get in the trenches. It's the blood, sweat, and tears. And so me hearing that, I was like, wow, am I doing that? Am I really experiencing more? You know, I'm this guy sitting behind this blog, like typing away and doing some little podcast interviews and that. Am I really putting myself on the line to grow? And so what, stands, what allows you to stand apart is by stretching. Not too much because you might snap, right? So stretching enough to actually have that growth, to experience that growth, to know for sure that you don't have those limits, that you can increase your belief because you've given it a shot and you've had some form of a result. And so what I did was I started challenging myself. Like you've seen Preston jumping in front of videos, I would jump in front of a video camera and at first it was like, I've got an idea and I want to you know, shoot this and it'd be like a bunch of takes. And now when I do it, it's like literally like, like you guys, like Alexi and Preston, it's like one, one take flow from the top of the head. Right? And you get, to that, you get to that point and you start trusting yourself. Start knowing that there's these little things which I call whispers of wisdom. Right? And I feel like it's kind of like your purpose keeps giving you those little whispers along the way. It's what happened to me throughout my whole growth of from seven years old up to now, 29 years old. Those little whispers, uh, my friend Peter Kelly says, the tap on the shoulder. The little quiet tap on the shoulder just there. And so that came up for me so many times when I saw the videos and the books and everything else. And you all here in this room today have experienced whispers of wisdom. Some of you may not have tuned into it. You might have had the, the, the volume down. And so I'd like to invite you to crank the volume up, listen to the music, you know, because there's so much going on out there that's truly amazing. And you're being blessed with these amazing gifts. Um, I, I was listening to a, a guy by the name of Miles Monroe. He's an incredible speaker. He's a, he's a Christian speaker and he's so powerful. Um, he actually died like not long ago, which is sad. He, he was in a plane crash in Bahamas, um, which is a tragic loss. But his content lives on. And you know, he said that you know, God produced us with a purpose. You know, when he brought us to this earth, like we have a purpose within us, right? He's like the manufacturer. It's like uh, you look at uh, these companies that manufacture products. They don't manufacture it and go, oh, well, we don't know what the purpose is. Let's like, just see what happens here. Let's work it out after. That doesn't work like that. So we all have a purpose and we're constantly being uh, you know, guided and have these little hints popping up here and there for us to really step up and deliver our unique gifts to the world. Yeah. So uh, there's, there's something that I want to share with you that uh, has come up for me recently uh, just by interviewing hundreds of successful people. And I love like getting really complex uh, findings and really simplifying them right down so they're easy to understand. And so after interviewing hundreds of successful people, being around incredible mentors like Tony Robbins and Simon Sinek, Gary Vaynerchuk and T. Harv Eker and all these incredible individuals, um, I've found a pattern. I'm always looking for patterns. When I interview people, I'm looking for the underlying thing, really. You know, you ask the questions and there's the surface level information, but then there's also the underlying thing, like what are they really saying? Where is this really coming from? What does it actually mean? And I sub-branch off that and, and try and pinpoint it and work it out. And I have anal uh, data on over 50 million unique people now from around the world that love self-development. And so for me, it puts me in a unique position to actually find out what actually makes people like tick, what makes them excited about learning more and growing. And what I found was I found that there's really the three, what I call the three uh, zones of excellence, the three dimensions of excellence. And the three dimensions, you might want to write this down, this is super complex based off all the interviews I've done, but I've really simplified it right down so you can just start ticking the boxes and making sure that this is what you're sticking to. So the first zone is beliefs. You have to believe. It's your mindset, right? This right here is the direction. It's knowing the direction that you're going in, right? And then the uh, second one is habits, right? And your habits are those daily uh, energy bolts of action, that persistent, consistent action that you take every day to get to that big end goal, that big end vision. It's like, you know, going out and, and swinging an axe at a tree. You know, if you went out and swung, you, you had like 50 swings at a tree, 
in one day, for sure you're not going to knock this tree down. It just won't happen. If it's a big tree, that's it. But if you went out every day and you swung, boom, 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 eventually you're going to knock that tree over. And so that's your habits. And then the last but not least is skills. That's the third zone of excellence. And skills, not just mechanical skills, because a lot of people think everything's mechanical. I always get asked, like, oh, how the techniques and the tricks. It's not all about that. A lot of it's emotional too. Um, but it's skills. So it's like skills as in the mechanical skills. How can you actually physically do the things you need to do, like learning Photoshop or um, you know, learning how to speak better and so on like that, right? Uh, but also emotional skills, how to communicate with others, right? So they're the three zones of excellence. And uh, to remember it in an even better way, it's ready, willing, and able. Ready beliefs, habits willing, skills able. This is the thing, you can't have one without the other. You need to have all of them. Because imagine that you were like, you were so willing and, and, and you wanted to be a doctor, right? It's like, I'm so willing to be a doctor, I'm ready, and this person comes in and you've got a chainsaw and you're ready to like, you know, hack and you're ready to do what you need to do if they come in and they need their leg like amputated in a certain way. And you have no skill at all, you're gonna make a mess, right? So you need each one. You need to, you can't miss any of them out. <laughs> and so yeah, that's really uh, what I focus on with my students. And it's interesting because a lot of my clients that come in, uh, you know, we, we set up a game plan for them and I always question, they like, come in with, you know, oh, I haven't been able to do this and that. And I always, I always look at the three zones and we can pinpoint it. They're not, they're not following through with their habits or they're not following through on, on developing a strong mindset to really make it happen. So, yeah, that's an interesting find that I've, I've stuck to and I believe in 110%. And I'm going to leave you with this. Uh, I'll, I live up in Santa Barbara in the mountains and I was standing on the balcony uh, the other day with my friend Joe. And Joe asked me out of nowhere, because in the morning we kind of go out there and we, we practice our gratitudes, which is truly amazing. Like all these people I interview, it seems to be the number one thing. It's like gratitudes, uh, meditation, and networking. They seem to be the, the three areas that a lot of these successful people focus on when it comes to habits. And so you don't go out there, practice the gratitudes, and really feel it in your body. Not just like say it, but actually feel it and mean it. And he, he asked me, you know, if you had one week to live, what would you do? Like no one had asked me that question before, and I just really thought to myself, wow, what would I do? And I challenge you to, to also think about that yourself as well once you leave here. Uh, and I said to him, you know, I said, I think I'd take like a day, 24 hours, to have somebody follow me with a video camera, and I'd just spill everything out. Like what I'm giving you right now is literally like 1% of what I've put together in the content that I know. So I just spill as much as I can out, and I allow them to give it to anybody, and they can chop it up and make mini clips and whatever. It'd kind of be like the last lecture, like Randy Porsche, right? And then I said, I would, I've been offered millions of dollars for Addicted to Success, but if I couldn't sell it for a million, if someone wasn't willing to put it down that day, um, I would drop it to like 500K or whatever it is, right, and sell it off. And with that money, I would pay for my friends from all around the world to come down to the southwest coast of Australia to have a final party with me on a big boat, and we'll hang out on the beaches, and we'll just live it up. Yeah. And he said to me, he's like, wow, isn't that interesting? Like, all the things you're doing now to make more money and to... Um, you know, to, to build the business. And he said, it, it, in your final days, all that stuff doesn't actually matter. You're not going for the money, are you? So he's, he's like, how can you start living in that way more? Not fully, because it'd be a little bit irresponsible to go and do that. But like, how can, you, how can you really start operating from that place a little bit more? And so the whispers of wisdom um, is really what we need to start listening to. So we know for sure that we're here and we're effective in what we do on this earth. Because it'd be a damn shame if you, know, you, you died and, and you didn't give the world your unique gifts and your unique greatness. So yeah, thank you so much for having me here today.